there are times in your life when so many bad things happen all at once that you go into what I call a trauma storm. Like if there were just one thing, like a health crisis or the end of a relationship, something like that, you'd be able to manage it. Now, if there were two things, if you added on now losing your job or a loved one dies, you'd possibly still be able to hold yourself together. But sometimes the shock to your nervous system of those traumatic events is so overwhelming that you lose your normal structures and habits that allow you to get through hard times. And instead you just kind of slip into crisis mode, meaning you can't function. Your daily routine is all over the place. Your mental stability is in jeopardy. You're angry, you're exhausted, you're crying, and you're in danger of pushing away the people who normally would be your support system. Now, I don't know why, when it rains, it pours, and I've had a few trauma storms in my life. Each time was terrifying because in that shaken state, old trauma wounds can kind of backflow right up into your life again. And emotionally and mentally, you can't handle it. You're either gonna break down or if you're lucky and you know what to do, you can break through. Because when I look back at the hardest times in my life, I remember that I was miserable and I would have done anything to get out of that pain. I just wanted time to go fast and get me out of there. But each time my passage through a trauma storm forced me to get more honest and to face for real where I still needed healing. And so there's this timeline of like, trauma storm leads to transformation then back to trauma storm, then transformation. And then each time though that transformation happens, you end up on a slightly higher level. Then another trauma storm comes to force you to change for the better again. And so when I look back, what I remember about trauma storms is that they were the beginning of the happiest periods of my life, that they triggered a blossoming. And I'd really just like to coast for a while, you know, because I haven't had a trauma storm in a while, but you know, you never know when it's going to come for you. So trauma storms, if you can survive them, can be powerful points of growth in your life, if you can survive them. And ironically, it's exactly when you're going through hard times that you're likely to abandon what actually works for you to keep yourself physically balanced and out of self-defeating behaviors that re-traumatize you and suck you back down. So it's super important during trauma storms that you recognize that it's happening and you arrest it. You stop the effect of the storm. You can't always stop the traumatizing events themselves, but you can take super good care of your emotional health and your nervous system to keep it balanced and regulated while you recover with the events themselves and make the positive changes in your life that you are shown through these traumas are needed. So what does it look like? when you're in a trauma storm. First, while you may get really overwhelmed by major official traumas, you'll find yourself getting overwhelmed by just regular daily stressors. Someone honks at you, you get a parking ticket, you lose your keys. A sign that you're in a trauma storm is that your reaction to these normal level, level stressors is out of proportion. It's too strong and it's scaring people. And even when you catch yourself and pull your reaction back, the emotional hangover goes on and on and on. It doesn't resolve in the normal amount of time. Now you might also notice during a trauma storm that your attention is you know, all over the place. You wanna go buy milk, but you can't find your purse. And then you find your purse, but you see there's water on the wood floor and then the phone rings and then you forgot the milk and so on. This is a feeling <laughs> that I've known so well in my life that I have recurring bad dreams about it. And I call them dysregulation dreams where I'm trying desperately to get somewhere, usually like to the airport. I used to do a lot of business travel. So I have this dream that I'm at a hotel and I'm swimming and I go, oh no, I have to catch my plane. And then I, I, I want to do that, but I can't remember where to go or where's my stuff or what's my room or do I have shoes or what am I supposed to wear or what time is it? And the stress goes up and up and up and you can't bring it down. And that is the feeling of being in a trauma storm. And even if you're not in full freak out and you're not consciously feeling stressed, being in a trauma storm can show up as you starting things but not being able to finish them. You're flitting from thing to thing, like you're, like you're driven to keep seeking something, but you don't have any power for follow through. It's not the same thing as procrastination, but it's like that because you can't get anything done. 
So another sign that you're in a trauma storm is that you're thinking a lot about the past and you're worrying a lot about the future. You're basically time traveling to 1981 or last week when someone offended you or you've already moved in to tomorrow when you're going to see someone you have a crush on and you're thinking about what you'll say and what are you gonna have for lunch and meanwhile right here and today you're not dealing with anything at all stuff's not getting done the things you're responsible for are falling apart so the trauma storm keeps you from feeling a sense of priority about what needs your attention right now and this is probably one of the most direct ways that traumatic experiences generate more traumatic experiences you can't see problems coming because your attention isn't here and being in a trauma storm can also keep you constantly dysregulated making you feel spaced out numb sleepy during the day agitated at night when you'd normally be sleeping and that kind of reminds me of like having a new baby very dysregulating which is an example of how trauma storms can get set off by good things too not just bad things with good things or bad things stressing you, changing your pattern, you get thrown off. You're tired. You're emotional. You might be struggling to take care of basic hygiene. You haven't taken a shower in days and you're grazing on yucky snacks all day but not eating meals. The dishes are piling up. You can't find your keys. <laughs> that always happens to me. And you're calling DoorDash just to get something to eat and it's 40 bucks. <laughs> in fact, in a trauma storm, you might find yourself craving fast carbs like sweets and bread and ice cream or you're eating constantly or you're not eating at all or you're filling yourself up with coffee all day or alcohol now emotionally you might have a feeling of dread or grief or paralysis that feels bigger than you and in a trauma storm when you're not feeling wired and talking all the time you get spun out and exhausted but it's almost like you're seeking a stress state because if you were to just sort of be in neutral just sit there in neutral a whole bunch of emotions would come and get you. The sooner you can change one or two of these coping mechanism behaviors, you know what, I didn't mention smoking cigarettes. That used to be my favorite. So many cigarettes in the middle of a trauma storm, just you know, filling up ashtrays, they'd be all over the house. The minute that you can start making a positive change on just one of these behaviors, you can start to work your way out of the trauma storm. It's okay to feel scared and upset about the stressful things happening in your life, but it does no good to lose your daily rhythm and your emotional equilibrium to the point that you break down. That's not going to help anybody. It's not good for you in the moment. It's not good for you in the future. And it's not good for the family members and pets and coworkers who count on you. And so here are some things you can do to stop a trauma storm. All right, first, and this is the one I find really hard, you have to get serious about getting your sleep. Sleep gets very disrupted in trauma, so you have to be willing to like do the things you know to do. You know not to have caffeine in the afternoon. You know to get off screens, you know, at least a couple hours before bed. Maybe you have the power to do that. Maybe you're not there yet. But there are a few things that can help whether you're there yet or not, you know, when your schedule's messed up. So something that I just really realize I need is a dark, cool room. I put tape over the LED lights. I like, I like it dark. And to make sure it's dark, I use um, one of these. See this thing? It covers my eyes. This is from Manta. My brother recommended it to me when we were traveling in Europe recently. We were in Norway where there's like practically round the clock sun. And I was so tired. I was getting like three hours a night of sleep. And he, he told me about this and I ordered it. It was waiting when I got home, thank goodness. So even in the past, I used to buy sleep masks, but they were like flat and they would press on my eyes. I don't have very deep eye sockets, I guess, but they would press on my eyes and I'd wake up and my eyes would be like burning sore. But also they didn't really keep out the light. And I mean, I need it dark. And in the summer when it's light out a long time, if I don't get real darkness, I'm gonna wake up. I'm gonna wake up the minute the sun comes up. So look, it's Velcro. You can like adjust the distance of your eyes so that you really get like a good fit. And it's this squishy stuff that really, you know, it's just, it doesn't hurt at all. And this is what's different about it too. It's squishy and it's flat right at the side. So if you lay on your side like that, then you can, yeah, you, it's the only mask you can, that I know of that you can sleep on your side and it doesn't slip off. 
and they have all these different textures. This one, this one is the Pro, and I got it because it just like I just wanted it to be super comfortable on my side because who knows where I'm going to move around. But I'll show you what it looks like. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Here it is, and I velcroed on, and there it is. And I guarantee you, I can see nothing. No light gets in. And it's really, it's just really gentle. It's comfortable. You can wash it. And there's some other kinds. There's one made of silk, which sort of appeals to me. There's one that has like Bluetooth sound. So if you want to listen to binaural beats going to sleep, I, I don't always want to listen to stuff at bedtime, but I know a lot of people with CPTSD do. And then they have ones that are cooling, ones that are warming, and um, just some different kinds. So I liked this so much. I was like, I got to talk about this on YouTube. I contacted the company and I'm like, you know, can I be an affiliate? So I got a link where you can get 10% off. And I'm going to put that down in the description section on all the videos. And I'm just going to keep it there indefinitely. So you can get 10% off on these things. And uh, they're pretty wonderful. And if you buy one, let me know what you think. All right, another thing. Here's another product. Also waiting for me when I got home was a weighted blanket. All right, have you done weighted blankets? So those, these are popular for people who get dysregulated or who have trauma or maybe are on the autism spectrum. But a weighted blanket is um, stitched up so it's got heavy stuff in it. And I bought one a few years ago and I hated it. <laughs> it was 30 pounds, it was queen size, it had plastic beads in it, which I, I tend to think is just, I just don't, I don't know, it's just turning out that plastic beads are in everything and I don't think it's a great idea. But the main thing is it was so heavy and hot, like I couldn't really move and I found it claustrophobic. I didn't like it. And even just like folding it up to put it off the bed or it was so difficult. And it said, oh, it's really washable, but you know, 30 pounds, 30 pounds, it was so much. And in the end, I, I jammed it into a, a broken laundry basket and I stuck it out on the street with a little sign that said weighted blanket free and somebody took it. But that's how much I didn't like it. And I paid 300 bucks for that. So I thought weighted blankets weren't for me, but I found one that works a lot better for me. And this is weird, I'm gonna show it to you. I can't, <laughs> I can't really show it to you when it's on, but it looks like this, okay? This is what it looks like. This is 15 pounds and it is twin size, which works a lot better for me. I have a husband, he snores. I don't always sleep with him. And, um, but if I did, he sure doesn't want a weighted blanket anywhere near him. So I have this, and 15 pounds is so much more manageable, but here's the thing that's cool about this, this sleep and glow blanket. It has little tiny glass beads. I can feel them, you know, you wouldn't be able to feel it, but it's sort of got a little bit of fill in it. And then this little bit of like grit that these are glass beads and they stay distributed inside the little, you know, quilted squares there. But here's what happened. So I can't, I, on my way home, I was in Europe for a month doing my live shows last month. <laughs> and on the way home, it was that it was a weekend when there were storms on the East Coast. And, you know, my airline ended up giving me a free flight to Europe. It was so bad. But we got on our flight, which was supposed to be direct from London to San Francisco. And partway through, <laughs> well, the flight ended up delayed and the people who worked at the airline, um, you know, they're not they're only allowed to work like a decent amount of hours, not a crazy amount of hours. You do not want your pilot that tired. And they basically had to like they, there was no way they could fly all the way to San Francisco in the in the in the right amount of hours that was legal for them. And so they said, we're going to, we were already up in the air we had, after the delay. And they said, we're going to have to find a place to land like somewhere in the United States. So we end up in Washington DC at like three in the morning. And, um, and you know, it's, that's, it wasn't that fun there and no one knew what was going on. Security wasn't even open. Finally, somebody opened the TSA line. We were there for hours. Nobody knew what was going on. There were no signs. People were just running around asking each other. And there were a lot of other people. It was just, a, it was just one of those like snafu weekends on the airlines and um, it was no one person's fault but they had to wait until they could find a crew who was rested who could come back on our plane and we could carry on and go home so anyway we get, we we get home like so it was like the longest flight ever and we finally finally get home so my manta mask was waiting for me my sleep and glow blanket was waiting for me and so i get finally to my bed i've been up so long and uh and I pulled out this, I didn't even have a, I didn't have a duvet cover or anything. I just took that weighted blanket and I threw it on my little day bed away from my husband, put on the mask, put in my earplugs and I laid down and I, for the first time I got to feel this is what it's like to have a weighted blanket on you. 
it's very snuggy. It's nice. And you, this is like light enough and small enough, twin size, 15 pounds, and this very, very breathable construction so you don't get hot. That's the beauty of it. It's, you know, you do, I don't want to be hot. I don't know about you. I don't want to be hot. So it's got this like, I don't know, it's temperate and you can use it in the winter. You can use it in the summer. And, but the pressure of the weighted blanket on your whole body, the, what, what it says in the literature is it feels like a mother's hug. <laughs> I don't want to say that to you because I know that's kind of a loaded concept, but you get the idea it is. It sort of communicates to your nervous system. It's like, okay, you're snuggy now. You're in your bed. It felt great. And I just went right to sleep and I stayed asleep. And so I've just been using it. I use it I just use it every night and I love the feeling of it. And I'm somebody, I do have trouble staying asleep in the morning. I think it's like women of my age often have that. And I'd say between the mask and the blanket, I'm getting an extra 90 minutes of sleep every morning, which is life changing. It's very good. And so I have a link for that too, where you can get a discount using this link that they gave me down below. So down in the description section, you'll see a link for better help, online therapy. You'll see the sleep mask. You'll see the weighted blanket if you want to give it a try too pretty cool. So sleep is super important to getting out of, out of a trauma storm. If you don't do that, hardly anything else is going to work. All right. Second, you should eat protein and dinner foods. Don't forget your dinner foods, like cooked food that has protein and vegetables in it. If you want to get out of a trauma storm, I want to stress, don't drink alcohol, go very low on sugar, go easy on the fast carbs like bread and pastries and you know any kind of sweets. Those things, they just, they amp up your system and they make it hard to bring you back down. Everything that you're doing to get out of the trauma storm is just trying to get like level again, physiologically and mentally. So another thing to do is also just drink a lot of water, drink a lot of water because let's just assume, I always wonder like, is this even true that toxins are being released? I, sometimes I think that's a metaphor, but whether it is or it isn't, water is very good to drink. Okay, another thing is go outside and move around out there. Take walks if you're able, run if you can. But going outside and like seeing the sun and noticing where it is, like Andrew Huberman talks about this, like go see sunlight the first thing when you wake up in the morning. That's a nice thing to do. Go see sunlight anytime. Go see the gray sky if it's gray outside, but help your brain and your nervous system like understand what time of day is it? What time of year is it? Your body, you know, we, we all evolved on this earth to be very, very sensitive to the time of year, the season, the time of day. There's a lot of cues there that, that send signals to your body and release hormones. So going outside is how you can start, you know, it, it's sort of like um, a defibrillator, right? <laughs> For your nervous system going outside. A defibrillator, it's those paddles where you can restart a heart, you know, so that's what it's like. You go outside and restart your nervous system, sort of get set again. Where are we? Oh, it's noon. Okay, noon. All right. So your body times itself. It needs to know. And then moving around, exercise is probably the single most powerful thing that you can do about depression and dysregulation. Exercise that sort of elevates your heart rate, you know, depending on your level of physical ability, mobility, what you're able to do, getting a little bit of sweat going and moving is so, so good for you. And we'll just start, you know, it just gives you this great reset. So take walks if you're able, run if you can. All right, now let's talk about how you talk about trauma. Be selective. Despite what some people think, talking about the traumatic thing, the thing that you're very upset about, might not be best for you at all times. There's probably a time for it. There's a person who's good for you to talk about it. But if it ends up being talking over and over and over and over again about what happened, it can re-traumatize you. It can get you dysregulated and make it very hard for you to sort of physiologically come back from that intense stress, the big shock that you've just been through. So one thing you can do to express things when you want to talk about what's going on that are less triggering is to write about it. You can write about it and read it to somebody or share with them what you wrote, let them read it but you do not always have to talk about it. So think about that, be selective. Choose your companions wisely. The people who you don't feel that great with, you're not safe with, who stress you out, who make a mess when you need people to actually help you tidy up, like mm, maybe not such a good idea. And I know how hard it is to set boundaries when you're already in a trauma storm. It's really good if you have somebody to run triage for you, a friend who, who helps coordinate and they decide who's going to come over and they decide, you know, they just sort of take things in hand for a while. They get people to make you meals. These are things that can happen in certain trauma storms. Somebody died, you have a baby. Sometimes people will help you in this way. 
So it's good to have a friend run triage and say, I'm just checking in on you today. You know, how are you doing? Did you go outside? Do you want me to come over and we'll go outside? That's a good friend. That's a good thing to do. Now you're going to have limited focus. It's scattered, right? So when you do use your focus, use it to perform short, simple physical tasks like wash a few dishes, um, organize some shoes, take out the trash in the kitchen, just a little thing. Don't try to do a major thing like clean out all the cupboards, just a little, one little thing at a time. You can make a clean little orderly space where you can put something beautiful, you know, like um, pick some branches from the garden and stick them in a vase and have one table cleared off where you have that and then sit at the table. Like just let yourself keep experiencing physical touch like you're a little kid in Montessori school. I went to Montessori school and that's what it's like. Kids learn through tactile experiences, tidiness about how the world works and how, how we connect with it. It's very regulating to do that. Make a cozy place to relax, a really good place to sit down where you can put your feet up. Um, in Bright Line Eating, they have this phrase called bunny slippers, and it's sometimes literal, literal, but it's usually figurative, you know, little fuzzy slippers, that you give yourself permission to really put your feet up and relax and treat yourself very tenderly when things are hard. Also, when you're in a trauma storm, give yourself permission to do nothing. If you watch TV, just go ahead and watch TV, no guilt. But here's what I would caution you. Don't watch TV for more than like an hour and a half at a time. Take a break. If you really wanna binge on a show, take some breaks, move around, go outside. Don't get hypnotized by TV or anything else or like an angry conversation or, you know, you can get hypnotized, like negatively hypnotized. And that will just sort of carry you back into your dysregulation and make it hard to come back out. One little thing that people like to do, and I did this once when I was in a very bad trauma storm, is I had a little healing box. Some people call it a God box. So you, it's a little box and it closes and it's your private space and you have a piece of paper and you can write down three to five parts of your life that have been hard for you because of what's going on. You know, let's say, you know, I keep missing work. My credit card debt's piling up. My kids are falling behind on homework. I yelled at the neighbor. These are all real things I had to write down. And you fold it up and you put it in the box and you just say, I don't know how to fix this, but I'm putting it in the box and I'm gonna let see if a way comes to me. A way did come to me, but I also would say I can guarantee you it's a good way to get the problem off your mind for a while so that you can rest your mind. You can't really solve problems mentally if your mind can't rest and can't have like periods of downtime and then come back and like think hard about how to deal with something. You can't just think hard constantly. If you want to, you can make a new list every day or every hour even and add to it and put it back in there. So it's just a, it's just a place for you to put your worries. Um, you can think of ways to get help. So if you're like me, it's very hard to ask for help when you're down, when it's hard and everybody says to you, let me know if there's anything I can do, okay? Okay, bye. <laughs> but that's not really the most helpful thing because when somebody's in a trauma storm, they can't really think of what they need, you know, whether they're in shock or dysregulated. They can't, it's like, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I'll let you know if I need anything. But by the time you know what you need, it's back to, oh, I don't think I can ask. That's too much to ask. So. If you can write down in advance some things that you need, it's like, okay, well, here's what would be good. I could really use a big container of soup from Whole Foods. I like the, I like the cauliflower and cheese soup. Um, I could also use, you know, some corn crackers with that and, you know, what I need. And I could use some drinks and we're out of paper towels. And so you can put that down and have a little clear place on that table with the vase on it where these are the things, if anybody says, can I do anything, you can ask them. You can say, on Tuesday, I have an hour to take a walk and I would really love to have some company. So you write down the things as you think of them because you cannot think of them on the fly when you are in a trauma storm. So you have your little list or post-its or you, t you know, type them into your phone somewhere where it's really easy to find. I can't find anything like even under the best of circumstances. <laughs> so you make it as easy as you can, all right? And then you're ready to ask for help. So finally, I teach this technique, the daily practice, which is the very foundation of how I stay regulated, how I have changed my life so that I don't make 
the destructive decisions that had me in trauma storms again and again and again. And uh, I'm always trying to share it with you here, but I really want to encourage you, like if you're in that crisis state right now, this would be a great time to try the daily practice techniques that I teach. It's a free course. It takes about an hour to get through the learning part of it. If you take that course, you also get emails from me to join me on Zoom with a few hundred people. We all do the techniques together and I take questions and it's really nice, actually really great community. And you can use those techniques again and again all by yourself. You can show them to other people. You can do them together with people. It's really been a positive part of my life and absolutely what I credit with helping me overcome complex PTSD. It also helps me get sleep at night and helps me just come back to be able to use common sense about like what should I eat or who should I hang out with. So all those things that are hard to do when you're in a trauma storm get easier when you use these techniques. It's a very simple writing technique and a meditation technique to sort of release the stressful thoughts and kind of bring your full awareness back online to just be kind of like here and aware of what's going on and to give yourself a little comfort and ease. So the daily practice course, it's free. There's 25 FAQ videos there, by the way, for anybody who took it you know, in the past and has questions about it. I tried to do a better job of answering the questions that come up. What have you got to lose? You can click on this right here and you take the course yourself and I will see you very soon.